Hello everyone and welcome. Today we have something uh, kind of throwbacky, special planned. So, Football is live! So while I haven't been like aggressively collecting antique clothing this year as I did in 2020, I have made exceptions for very special pieces. For example, one of my favorite acquisitions of this year was this complete riding habit that was made by London tailors in like 1881, 1882. I also got this really great Victorian aestheticism, like orange silk tea gown, which is just so good. I've been kind of steering away from just like generic bodices and skirts just because I have a lot of those pieces already and just really trying to focus on unique pieces. So when this coat popped up on Witchy Vintage's uh, Instagram stories, <laughs> I uh, got aggressive. And I was like, give, 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 give. I, I must have. I was luckily the first person to call dibs on it. And so she came home with me. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do an unboxing and we're gonna look at the garment. What you're gonna watch is me reacting to the garment from my initial reaction. I hadn't had a chance to study up on it before then. But I did wanna take a moment here before we go into the unboxing to kind of give a little bit of history of what I've been able to find out about this garment. So we have a little bit more context about what we're looking at. What we're gonna be looking at today is what I believe we would call an Ulster coat with a treble cape that is detachable. It is for a woman and it's, it is made out of wool. And I believe it's called an Ulster based off of the original garment drafting manuals that I was able to find on archive.org that have patterns for women's coats and exterior garments. And an Ulster is, it seems to match up with the length the and the cut of the coat. And also the tradition of Ulsters actually having capes on them as well from like the long Victoria era. Now, when it comes to the dating of this coat, originally I thought it was going to be like late 1890s. So like 1898, 1899. However, when I was doing research and looking at delineator catalogs and ladies magazines for what the trends were, what I actually realized is that that circular cape style isn't actually indicative of the 1890s. That circular cape doesn't really seem to be trendy in the 1890s, but it is trendy in the early 1900s. So I was finding it quite a bit in like 1904, 1905. So when it comes to the dating of this coat, what I'm thinking is that it is probably somewhere between 1898 and 1908. And I'm giving myself like a 10 year range there just because the general cut of the coat is kind of hard to date. That circular cape style is iconic. She's an icon. She's a legend and she is the moment. In the 18th century, these types of garments were usually called like overcoats with the big treble capes, masculine garments usually. But for the late Victorian and Edwardian era, they were also worn by women. There's also like box coats, automobile coats, Norwich, long coats, short coats, just cloaks, palatots, whatever. Like there's a whole variety of exterior winter wear that women could wear in the Victorian and Edwardian era. So it's not just like one thing where, you know, like nowadays we kind of have like a coat and the coat is either long or short. We don't really have like a huge variety of cuts, I guess is a good way to describe it. I'm kind of jealous actually thinking about it. Like it's fairly nice to have more options. Anyways, one of the other things I really love about collecting pieces like coats and 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 cloaks and, and working wear and, and just kind of unique pieces that are not just like your standard bodice or pretty gown. It makes this seem just more real. Like someone wore that. And you know, and it says so much about her, how she views uh, the outdoors, what she thinks about colors, what she thinks about practical wear, you know, it's not just this kind of lip of a moment in time of like an evening gown that might've only been worn once, but like this coat was something that was worn all the time. And, and it really had to reflect the wearer and like what she was interested in. So it's like, you know, was this girl really sporty? Did she really like going outside in the winter? And she liked going on walks and she was outdoors a lot. You know, she had to have something super practical or, or was this just like a thing that she wore for several years and she didn't wear it very often. It says so much much about the person who wore it, you know? And it just, to me, it makes the past seem more tangible. It makes the people who lived a hundred years ago seem like they're in the room with us instead of, you know, these distant kind of vesper and like whispers of, of people. It's, they just seem so much more real and honest. And, and like, you could sit there and like hold this coat and like, know what she was like. And I just really love that about these kinds of clothes that you don't necessarily get the same vibes from, from like fancier antique garments that were only worn like maybe once or twice. Like I just, yeah, this is really cool. I think you're gonna really like this coat. All right, so with that little brief intro, let's get into the unboxing of this baby, shall we? Ooh. 
I think we're ready to unbox this thing. So inside of here is a, what I believe is an 1890s coat for a woman with like multiple capelets. It might technically be an overcoat. I'll pop the technical correct term up here, but for right now, we're just calling it a coat for clarity's sake. First, we gotta lay some acid-free tissue paper down. I gotta wash my hands. And then once that's all done, we'll get into this. First things first, we take our tissue. Excuse me, excuse me. Hi, hi, hi. So while I'm washing my hands, I thought this would be a really good time to actually think the sponsor of this week's video, Skillshare. First, I freaking love Skillshare, okay? Like as an internal student, I get a lot of serotonin and dopamine like when I learn new stuff. I love that there is a website with thousands of classes and like this huge online learning community where I can just go down any rabbit hole. Like, do I wanna learn about graphic design today? Sure, why not? Do I wanna take a course on how to write for comedy? Sure, why not? Do I wanna learn about Procreate? Oh yeah, I do. I do wanna learn about Procreate because this girl loves a good doodling. I suck at drawing and so whew, Procreate and I, mm, we have a good time together. One of the things that I really wanna learn and focus on for 2022 is photography as well as just like general cinematography too, but like really photography. I've actually been spending some time over the holiday break cause I'm filming this on December 23rd, by the way, taking Jessica Cobasi's uh, portrait photography class because I love her YouTube videos. I love her work. And so when I saw that this was a Skillshare class, I was like, <laughs> Sign me up, sounds great. I also do wanna give a huge shout out and congratulations to Bernadette Banner on her original Skillshare class called Hand Sewing Basics, Work Wonders with Fabric, Needle, and Thread. If you are someone who is wanting to start sewing uh, in 2022, whether you wanna sew clothes or costumes or cosplay, it, it doesn't matter. Having a solid foundation in hand sewing is just so important for your sewing journey. And Bernadette has that covered. So I highly recommend that class to anyone who wants to learn how to sew. And just as a friend, I am so freaking proud of Bernadette for putting this class out. Like, go best friend. So let's continue the annual tradition of self-improvement in 2022, my friends. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this week's video. And now, <sighs> now for anyone freaks out, I do this all the time. Please don't comment about box cutters in the comment section. This box, <sighs> it'll be fine. guys. Oh my gosh, I think she like really DIY'd the box. Card. Paula also always sends like fun like cards and stuff. Best Christmas wishes, 1911. Nice. Oh, here's one with a meatball. So there we go. Happy holidays. Let's see what's in here. Some pretty lace. Nice. Okay, so this is a like 19 teens brassiere. Nicole made one of these not too long ago, but it has the hook here in the front to help hold it onto the corset and it creates that nice smooth line. Okay, I'm gonna set this aside. Clear the meatball card off the table, I think. This is one part of the coat. The other part. I think this is the main part of the coat, so we're gonna open this first. She's real pretty. Oh, goodness. This tweet is gorgeous. Oh, and it's unlined, which means you can see everything. It's really nicely made, it's just unlined. All the raw seams have been finished with bias tape and just kind of pressed open. We have two little pockets on either side. So this part was stitched down to encase the tailoring that's done here at the front, but it's come undone here. So we can see there's a nice bit of like canvas buckram here. It's not super stiff. It's it's, uh, yeah, I would call it a canvas. I wouldn't call it a tarlatan. That's just left raw and it's just enough to kind of fill in this facing here where the buttons are. The buttons are actually stitched all the way through onto the facing too and it's just a single layer. So the wool is pretty thick. It's pretty chunky. It's nice and heavyweight. It's pretty tightly woven too, to be honest. It was really pretty. It was like pink and blue with red. 
originally and it's just kind of discolored from wear, but on the inside here, it's it's actually really bright and pretty. The bulkiness here at the front is just because of the front edge of the wool being folded over and then the matching wool facing laid on top and then it is stitched top stitched from the outside. So it creates this illusion of piping. So it's just a nice kind of trim and decoration, but it's very strong and sturdy and it's very, very thick. It's probably the same canvas on the inside of the collar. We have top stitching and decorative top stitching to help create structure and reinforcement in the collar, but it's pretty soft really. I don't think there's pad stitching on the inside. We have two hooks at the collar. It looks like there was a loop on either side that you probably could have buttoned over too, because we have these two small buttons here but there's no holes. So I'm thinking that there was a loop. There's evidence of something else that was cut off at some point in time that I think helped hold it really close at the neck, but I'm not 100% sure. It has the illusion of double-breasted, but it's single-breasted. So we don't have any room for air coming in through here once the coat is buttoned up. The sleeves are unlined as well. So again, this is not a complicated tailored garment. This is actually probably homemade from a pattern. You could get these patterns from Delineator. It is made out of a really nice wool fabric and it's obviously nicely made on the inside, but I'm not, I mean, it could be commercially made. There's no reason that it wouldn't be, but it also could be homemade. We have catches to hold the pleats in place. We have the really nice hooks and eyes, the locking hooks and eyes that will hold the back vent of the coat in place, but it could be undone. We have that, the box pleats here in the back or just the pleats are held into place with the same tape that was used for the binding. This is to kind of keep everything hanging nicely and prettily on the body. Actually, the construction for this is really straightforward. What they did before they actually did the hem of the coat to bring it up to where it's supposed to be, they actually bound the bottom completely in the same tape that every, that's used everywhere else. And then it was bound and then it was folded up once and then stitched into place. And it was stitched into place twice using a machine. So we have the initial stitch to get the length of the coat where we want it, but then we also have the decorative bottom stitch that creates that nice edging that we're seeing down the front of the coat as well. So it's stitched twice, but once more decorative than anything else. We have nice puffed sleeves here that are very much in keeping with either the Victorian era or the end of the 1890s. I'm thinking into the 1890s, honestly, which is kind of how this thing looked like it was shaped on the mannequin when I saw the photos. I could be wrong. It looks more in keeping with what we see for like late 1890s where we still are wearing bum pads and like padding at the butt and the hip, but we're not seeing anything like super huge and curvy. Now these buttons should be for the capelets that are here. We have the pockets, they are functional. They are faced in the wool, so then that way if the pocket flap shows up, you still, they're not very deep though. They are very shallow pockets. They're faced in that, in a brown cotton twill. It's so nice and utilitarian, nothing too overly fancy, but still it gets the job done. And this coat was really meant to last and you can tell that it was worn a lot. It was probably worn for several years. We have staining here at the bottom. I would wager it's probably mud and horse shit. It has seen some stuff and it was definitely like full length touching the ground. Something to think about when it comes to historic clothing and how society dealt with weather is that we dress for the weather regardless of where we were, if that makes sense. So nowadays, especially in the West, you know, especially in the United States, we have air conditioning and we have heat constantly. Right now it's, it's like 72 degrees up here because I am a lizard. But in the 19th century, early 20th century, 18th century, central heating varied. The houses weren't climate controlled in the same way that we live now. So you needed to dress for the weather. So if it was cold outside, you would dress for cold weather and you would just stay like that on the inside. You would wear a garment that's meant more to protect you from the elements, from snow, from rain, from sleet. And so one of the aspects of this are things like capes or capelets that would go over the coat. So your overcoat, you would often see have capes on them. And that is the cape, not the thing. That's a cloak. The big thing's a cloak, the small things are capes. So this coat has capes and capelets that go over it. It's also detachable. So if the weather was really bad, you could put this on. If it wasn't terribly bad, you, didn't, you could go out without it. But, oh, look at this. So we have four buttonholes. Chunky boys. The buttonholes go through the first two capes. So it goes through the two layers of wool, 
the top edge has been folded down and stitched just above where the buttonhole is. And so you're only going through two layers. Capes are unlined. The edges are finished just like the hem of the coat. So the edge of the capes have been bound in a bias tape and then they've been folded up once, stitched down and then stitched right along the edge and the top stitch to create this decorative finish. And all three capes are like this. They're all constructed in the exact same way. So the capes would have been constructed separately and then they would have been put together at the very end. Easy construction and you can see they're all together and they just go. They don't have any hooks or anything in the front. They're meant just to kind of hang open. But you can see with these layers and how they're staggered like this, it's meant to help have the weather brush off and away from the body and it will help protect the shoulders, the back, the neck, in the shoulders and the neck. With this, we're looking at anywhere between four to six layers of wool. And that's not including the clothes that you're actually wearing underneath, which would be wool. And you would probably have a wool knit union suit on. You would have probably an additional layer of a corset cover that was probably also wool. So you would have multiple layers of silk and wool underneath of this to help keep your body warm and insulated and protected from the weather. I think, we're done looking at her. She's really straightforward. She's beautiful. Let's go check her out and see what she looks like on the mannequin. I was dressing her on the mannequin and I noticed something. This was not done very well. And you can tell that it historically was like this because the button, it, it just doesn't fit with this button here. It overlaps here, it's too chunky. And you can see the signs of struggle <laughs> on getting this button with how this button is chipped because I literally felt it chip in the same place when I was trying to attach the cape here. So I have a feeling when she wore the cape, this probably didn't want to sit very good. Unlike this side, which sits, you know, lovely. Like, it's great, it's fine, it lays nice and smooth. It looks really good this side. This button goes up a little too high. This is a little too bulky with all of that. The hooks and eyes here, so the collar can't actually be worn up like so. Now you can see what the capes look like on the coat. So looks really, really good. Yeah, she's definitely around like five, four, five, five. So you can see how well that would protect her upper body and her arms, especially the back. And if it blew, you know, it would blow the capes up like so. I'm surprised there's no buttons or hooks on this side to help have this section, this panel lay flat. You just kind of have to shove it in there. But this is what she looks like. She looks great. So what'd you think? Hmm? She's pretty, ain't she? She's real nice. She's a, she's a, she's a beaut. I'm really glad that I got her and I'm so happy that I was able to share her with you all. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below of the coat and the, and the detachable cape. Uh, I'm curious to know what you all think about that. And if you all like hanging out with me, do not forget to subscribe. I post on Sundays and we have a good time looking at old clothes, talking about dress history stuff and what have you. And I would love to have you here. With that, my friends, I do hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week and I will see you all back here soon with another video. Bye. Yeah, we match today, don't we? Yeah. Say goth dog and goth mom, huh? Also, like, can we talk about my dress real fast? So this is actually a reproduction, like 1890s, like house dress wrapper gown. From Witchy Vintage. She had it like small batch made by like a local dressmaker in Houston. And I was able to get in on the pre-order. I think she's gonna like start releasing them like for like general consumption for the public. It has this cool belt that has been like, 
has a bit of boning in it and it has like the interior like lining structure. Like this thing is so close. Like it's so close to the original. Like I would have no qualms wearing this like in a actual like Victorian capacity. I think this will be coming soon to a dark cottage core closet near you or something. I don't know. What do you think, Paula?